with Lady Alwyn Brogan on cataloging remains in the Tripolitanian pre-desert. In 1981 to 1982, while studying for his PhD, he was a Rome scholar in archaeology at the British School at Rome. Three years, uh, these years provided him with the opportunity to excavate at various sites in Campania, at Pompeii and Naples, upon the invitation of the Superintendenza Archaeologica. Most excavations in the city of Naples were conducted in advance of reconstruction following the 1980 earthquake. His interests include the study of settlement systems, ceramics, economy and the environment. He has conducted numerous other excavations and field surveys in different parts of, Europe, of the world, actually, at Fulham in Britain in, 1970, in the 1970s, at Hierapolis in Turkey between 1992 and 2003, in Hersonisos in Ukraine, and at several sites in Italy, such as the deserted medieval village sites of Quattro Macine, Supersano, San Nicola, and Apigliano, a Byzantine kiln site at Otranto, as well as numerous medieval churches, cemeteries, and castles in the province of Lecce. Current projects include also the mapping of Salento in the Middle Ages, an excavation at the castle of Lecce. He is also a specialist in French Art Nouveau ceramics. Professor Arthur is a member of the Society of Medieval Archaeology. He has been elected president of the Society of Italian Medieval Archaeologists since 2018, a nominated associate of the board of the International Center for Medieval Art, New York, between 2005 and 2008. Paul Arthur has published more than 300 journal articles, monographs, and papers in conference proceedings volumes. I mention only a few of his representative published works, such as the monograph Naples from Roman Town to City State, an Archaeological Perspective, published in 2002, Byzantine and Turkish Hierapolis, published in 2006, Apigliano, Villaggio Byzantino e Medievale in Terra d'Otranto, which he co edited with Brunella Bruno in 2009 and the edited volume A New World Emperor Charles V and the Beginnings of Globalization, published in 2021. Closing this introduction, I would like to kindly ask all the participants to keep their cameras off and their microphones muted. Should you wish to address a question or comment to our speaker, feel free to use the chat button on Zoom. You may also switch on your cameras after the end of the presentation to address your question directly to the speaker by raising your hand and unmuting your microphone. Uh, dear Paul, Professor Arthur, we look forward to hearing all about Byzantine Italy, your new, your new project, and, and the legacy of Byzantium in contemporary society. So thank you much. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Well, thank you, Athanasius. And thank, I should like to thank you, uh, the research, archaeological research unit of, uh, of the University of Cyprus for the opportunity to speak with you today. I, I will, for the next hour, I will pretend that I, I am with you in Cyprus, also because I know the beautiful building behind you, and, and I had great times there many years ago. So uh, it's, it's, it's almost like going to one home. Um, so thanks, thanks for inviting me, and, uh, and I'll give a chat now about what I, I've been doing, what we've been doing, what we think of, of Byzantine Southern Italy. So uh, uh, let's see if I can now start the running. I should be able to do it quite easily. I, uh, I hope you can all hear me very well. We can hear you very well. Yes, perfect. So let me do the share screen. Click here. Let's see. Yes. And then I believe... Presentation. Yes. Fine. Wonderful. Thank you. Ah, thank you. Okay. So, um, well, this is just the, the project, uh, well, not the project, this is the, the lecture I'm giving this evening. Um, I call it the actuality of Byzantine Italy. Um, I, I won't <clears throat> talk about what everything is going on because, as I was saying to, um, to my friend and colleague earlier, uh, this lecture is, um, could even go on for two hours with no problem. So I'm cutting things just to get to the, uh, the heart of the matter. But by the actuality of Byzantine Italy, what I, what I want to say is how things are standing at the moment and how I believe we can move forward from um, many years of uh, perhaps not very great interest in Byzantine Italy. Um, this is a period now of, of growing knowledge. 
Um, this, these are just a few of the major events that we can see um, took place over the last few years. I want to show you, well, first of all, the absolutely excellent book, which I, I recommend. I don't get a percentage on sales, so don't worry. But uh, I recommend The Companion to Byzantine Italy, which is edited by Salvatore Cosentino, who teaches in the University of Venice. And it's a very, very uh, thorough examination through numerous authors of the current state of affairs of our knowledge of Byzantine Italy. It's more historical than archaeological, but although Salvatore Cosentino is an historian, he has not wanted to ignore archaeology, it's just that the archaeology is not as far developed. There's less of a tradition. But anybody wants to, I, I should have photographed it sideways because it's a very, very thick book. I can't remember the number of pages, but I, I think that's, that's worth getting. Um, another very important uh, work that's been done recently is the archaeology of regime change, Sicily in tradition. It's a, it's a it's, um, project known as Sick Transit um, that's been running from 2016 and actually finished in January, this January, uh, 2023. And it's an a, a, a EU project, ERC project, um, very well financed and led by Professor Martin Carver of the University of York. And in his project, the aim has been to examine uh, archaeological, mainly archaeological change from late antiquity to Swabian times, that is to the later Middle Ages. And we shall be expecting over the next year or so, the publications, the final publications of what is a fascinating project that examines things like uh, genetics and, 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 and mobility, uh, pathology, uh, food, and so on. So that's going to be a, a, an important um, data, data from Sicily. And then the last thing I mentioned is, the, is it a public exhibition. Um, doesn't really go into great depth as an exhibition, although it's worth looking at if you happen to get to Naples, which started last year and which will be ending in April this year. It's in the Muse National Museum of Naples. Um, it will have a catalogue that will be published fairly shortly, and the catalogue has been written by major scholars, so it will be another important uh, component of what we get to know for Byzantine Southern Italy. So the last few years have been fairly rich in our subject and represent growing knowledge. Why isn't this going further on? There's something happening here. Uh, ah, there we, there we go. Ah, strange. Um, now, when I started to look at uh, living in, in Byzantine Italy, I, I live in, uh, I don't know if uh, uh, Athanasios, uh, if you can see that the map to the right is partly obscured. Or is that just my, on my screen? Athanasios? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, of course. We, uh, we can see the map. Uh, the the right-hand side map, Anemia Mediterranea, is partly obscured. Can I close that somehow? Perhaps not. No, 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 you cannot do it now. Oh, okay. A pity because you can't see the map properly. Okay. <laughs> Um, what I want to show you here are four maps of Byzantine Italy. Now, the one at the top, which I hope you can read, is Byzantine Italy in around 600 AD. So we're talking about the period just after the uh, Justinian, Justinianic War of the mid-6th um, century, and how land has been divided up following the Lombard invasion of the later 6th century. And you'll see in grey the extent of Byzantine rule. I mean, it's 50% of Italy, southern Italy, the islands, and uh, Naples, Rome, a long swathe all the way up to Ravenna and the Pentapolis, and other parts of Italy as well. So a lot of Italy was in Byzantine hands after um, the end of Justinian and his war. But this changed quite quickly or relatively quickly. By the middle of the eighth century, 
almost everything north of um, southern Italy had been lost to Byzantium. And what we end up is the map in the center. The central map says Byzantine Italy 700 plus, where you will see in dark gray what was left after 600, and in light gray what was reconquered at the end of the ninth century a bit by Emperor Basil I. But my reason for putting these three maps below on is because to the left, you can see Greek dialects, modern Greek dialects, dialects that have been going for centuries. And they're all in Sicily, Lower Calabria, and the lower part of Puglia. And if you compare to the central map, the dialects seem to be almost exactly in the same parts of Byzantine Italy after 700. If you then look at the right-hand map, map, you can see the distribution of Anemia Mediterranea, which of course is a blood disorder. Um, and it's very common in Byzantine lands. And the distribution in Italy almost fully respects the area of old Byzantine Italy and what was reconquered by Emperor Basil I at the end of the ninth century. So what I'm saying basically is that there are a lot of elements, Greek dialects, Anime Mediterranea, and others that I will show you shortly that uh, are almost certainly tied to the periods of to 500 years of Byzantine occupation. We're talking about a half a millennium, and I cannot believe that in half a millennium uh, there was no strong impact on this country. Now, here we have, um, um, uh, in, in white, uh, something I took off, I think, one of the Wikipedia sites. So when I think about these 500 years, um, I, I notice that there is some sort of uh, difficulty in accepting uh, Byzantine or Greek influence in Italy. Many scholars who often view Byzantium, I'm talking about scholars, uh, not, not uh, members of the public, often view Byzantium as a civilization that was centered on Greece, Asia, and the Black Sea. That is, what was west of the Adriatic was not part of the empire. And there are many scientific and serious publications that totally forget that Italy was also part of Byzantium for 500 years. And so perhaps even more importantly, the Italians, the populace, the people in the street um, often see the empire as being alien to the country. It, it's, it contradicts both nationalist and religious ideals, and thus it is lost out in historical narratives. Ever since the Normans arrived in the 11th century, followed by other uh, dominating powers, followed by the Renaissance, followed by the, uh, the Latin church in Rome, and eventually followed even by Mussolini, there's been uh, uh, almost an unconscious attempt to destroy or to uh, hide everything that leads to Byzantine Greece. It's as though one had to bring out a purity of Italy, saying this is Italian, we don't owe anything to anybody else. And heaven help us if we thought that half a millennium of Italy was actually part of an Eastern Empire. So the little quote below comes from a school book. Um, I'll translate, it's in Italian, talking about the Mezzogiorno, Southern Italy. It says that the culture of the South, of South Italy, um, was, uh, is a rich bearer of many historical experiences through a multi-century uh, multi Greek presence, but by Greek, they mean Magna Graecia, classical Greece, the um, heritage of the Arabs and Normans, and even some, some influence and some Spanish influence. But Byzantine Greece is totally forgotten. There has been a conscious, ideological, political, and religious removal of, of history, which is totally wrong, whatever you want to do. 
And so we should, in a sense, remove the stereotypes of Byzantine Italy. I mean, these are three magnificent uh, monuments, this lovely coin of uh, Theophilus, um, the uh, Catholica at Stilo in Calabria, and of course, the famous Justinianic mosaic in, uh, in Lorena. But these are stereotypes. These are top-down representations of power, but do not really uh, explain to us how Byzantine Italy worked every day for 500 years. That is, has until fairly recently been totally invisible, uh, or, or I should say, uh, hidden information. So we're trying to go on from go on. Go on from so let me show you just a few things because it's near dinner time. It may may whet your appetite to know that we have this sort of food in uh, in southern Italy and in, in Sicily. And I'm sure that the Greek uh, the Greeks who are following this lecture recognize their own food. Um, I can't pronounce the tiganospomo correctly, also known as Listopita, or the Kataifimi, which is Kataifimi both west and east. These are in the top, to the top, we have a, a, a rustico. Um, we have rusticos, and you know, what do you call that in Greece? I can't read, I've written it down, but I, I can't see uh, what it says. But it's, um, it's made with spinach, spinach. We have them here as well. So we have the same sort of food. We have the same sort of wine. Many of the South Italian wines are Negro Amaro. Um, um, what are they called now? Um, well, I can't remember various names, but they are from Greek um, <laughs> derivations and presumably arrived in, in Byzantine times. We have dances and music. This is the famous pizzicata or taranta, um, for which Salento is famous, where women um, go into trance with dancing and people playing the music with symbols. Um, and this is supposed to be because of a poisonous spider called taranta. Again, this is first attested in the 16th century, as you can see above in the uh, pastoral relief in Lecce. And I wonder, could this come from Byzantium? If not, perhaps it comes from the Balkans, which were also heavily uh, colonized and, and, and uh, governed by Byzantium. Modern towns and communications. Well, I'm speaking mainly about Puglia, because although the project that I, I'll speak about is the project I'm running is for the whole of Southern Italy and Sicily. This is the area where my unit is working. And this is just a modern tourist map. And I can guarantee that almost all the place names, save for perhaps major towns, almost all the place names date from the early Middle Ages. And almost all these small towns were originally Byzantine villages. And so it goes to it goes to reason that most of the communication network dates also to the second half of the second millennium BC. So again and again and again, we are getting the heritage from those 500 years. And to this, we can add language. There are places in Puglia and in southern Sicily where they still speak and write in Greco. Greco is not ancient Greek. Greco is a language that comes out of, I think, medieval Byzantine Greek. I'm not a linguist, but that is what I'm told. And Greco can be found even in some parts of Sicily. Uh, and not to speak, as I say, of genetics and, and many, many other things that uh, we would love to study, but probably would just not have the time. So, because of this, I launched, I launched a major project. Well, in 2017, I uh, prepared a project with my colleagues and sent it to the Italian government, the Ministry of Culture, and said, look, this is what we want to do. 
they found the the program very convincing and gave us a substantial um, amount of money to run the project for some three years. And the project is called the Byzantine Heritage of Southern Italy, Settlement, Economy and Resilience in Changing Territorial Landscape Contexts. Below, you can see the web link. And I will invite you to look at the project, which is in Italian, um, Italian, English, and Russian. It's not in Greek, unfortunately. I would need somebody to translate it into Greek. But I'm sure that with Italian, English, and Russian, um, you should be able to follow it uh, with no problem. And that project will tell you, the, the, the website will tell you more about the project. Now, uh, this it's it's organized um, in four regions, and we have the University of Salento, which is my university, Foggia in Northern Puglia, University of Calabria, Catania in Sicily, and University of Basilicata. And then we have many associates working with our project to try and discover more about Byzantine Southern Italy, com 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 comprised of over 70 scholars from all around the world. We have people from the CNRS in France, for example, or, or, or scholars from Germany, who in some way will help us to get to grips on what happened in Southern Italy in those 500 years and afterwards. And we'll all meet again, and you're invited as well, to what will be a major Congress on the project, which we will hold probably around uh, Easter time of next year, in about a year's time. So it will be a, a chance for you to come over and spend Easter in, in Italy when the, the, the sun is warm and, and, and the sea is calm and the wine is always good. Our main objectives characterizing 500 years of Byzantium in southern Italy. Um, searching for an identity or identities and identifying unity and disunity. Uh, I say this because, of course, Byzantine Southern Italy was composed of many different people. The people who were originally uh, here in Italy, wherever they may have come from, let's say the Romans. Uh, a Jewish population, immigrant population such as the Slavs from at least the sixth century, immigrant populations from Asia Minor, from the area of modern Greece and Bulgaria and Macedonia, the Arabs. It became ever more a, a popuri, and so we're trying to identify the markings, the characteristics of each of these social groups to understand how these social groups interacted to create new characteristics, new shared characteristics, and therefore how we can identify uh, um, specific Byzantine factors from a plethora of factors that are brought in and then mixed up between the uh, new populations. Having done that, having searched for unity and disunity, we then need to disseminate the information at an, at an academic level, which means the Congress, which I have just mentioned to you, which means publication. And then we move on to disseminating information publicly, which we hope will help to rediscover people's roots, give them a further sense of place, and perhaps give a new input to tourism in Southern Italy, not just Magna Graecia, not just uh, sun, uh, nice weather, sea, pizza and spaghetti, but also other periods of history and their remains that can be equally fascinating and useful to, to know about. For some reason, it blocks everyone's ah. So what is archaeology re revealing now through our project? Well, the first thing, the first level is that of getting the information. And you can see in these two maps how much we've managed to uh, um, recover in the space of three years, just under three years. Uh, you'll see from the map at the top, top left, 
um, up to date, 2,039 sites, archaeological sites, that date between the 6th and the 11th century, which is actually quite amazing because until we started this project, very, very few sites were known. A lot of these have not been published, but now we know where they are. And now we found that there's a, a lot, large potential of information. You will see that some areas that are very, very well covered, like you can see that better from the map in the lower right, where we have density of uh, sites. You will see that the area of Lecce, the Salento, which is the small mm, heel of Italy, has a large amount of sites. The area of Matera as well, parts of Calabria, and certainly parts of Sicily. So the potential amount of information for what we're uh, doing rests on well over 2,000 sites, and many more will need to be uh, catalogued and found, especially in the uh, light pink or gray areas where virtually nothing is known. But they may also be in abandoned areas, they may have been uh, empty areas for which we will have to find an explanation. In examining these sites and in trying to uh, make sense of the history uh, the, the information is giving us, we've come out with eight uh, major phases. This will be uh, perhaps the most boring part of what I'm going to say, but I think it's important because between the first half of the 6th century and the mid to late 11th century, I think we can speak about eight different phases. They could be identified through our material remains and seem to be fitting into our historical discourse. So the first half of the sixth century, from Byzant Byzantium's point of view, high hopes and substantial spending up and through the reign of Justinian and the Gothic War, where we all know the glory of Justinian, Justinian the Great, and what he was able to accomplish in uh, uh, Constantinople, Istanbul, just think of Hagia Sophia, or uh, Justiniana Prima and Just Justiniana Secunda in the Balkans, or the mosaics at uh, San, San Vitale and uh, Santa Polinara Class in Ravenna. So it was a period of great public spending, and the war must have cost an enormous amount as well. So there were high hopes. I think that these high hopes and the enormous spending was one of the factors that brought to a severe recession. People win wars, but winning a war didn't always mean you're economically strong. Um, I think winning the Gothic or Justinianic war in the end almost brought Byzantium to its knees. So in the second half of the sixth century, when the Lombard invasion also took its toll on Italian territory, we have um, a severe recession. And we can learn about the severe recession through letters such as those of Pope Gregory the Great, which are very, very explicit. In fact, his letters around the late 6th and early 7th century do understand the turmoil that he is in and reflect, presumably, the turmoil that the state is in um, as to how to protect and to still get the most economically out of their possessions. So on the defensive and an attempted, re attempted reaction to crisis. But as the crisis deepened and deepened, inflation got worse and worse, there was a major recession. Um, the eighth century saw, um, sorry, most of the seventh century was a period of great turmoil. And on the archeological side of things, we see an almost total absence of 7th century sites. We see scatters, we see uh, classical buildings, classical towns being abandoned. We see the creation of castra, I'll show, I'll show an example, as people try to defend themselves within towns with 90% um, of the town being abandoned, being uh, used for quarry, and just 10% of the town being used as the center of uh, management. The eighth century then gradually saw a new regime, gradual stabilization of a center network periphery, so a center periphery network, sorry, um, but the eventual loss of North and Central Italian territories. From that time, 
from when Naples and Rome took their independence, and from when Ravenna was eventually conquered, and we're talking around 750s, um, Italian, Byzantium, Byzantium in Italy was mainly Puglia, Southern Puglia, Southern Calabria, Sicily, Sardinia. Um, but we were in a period of gradual growth. We see uh, the villages that they start, they start to become more and more frequent, and so do their, uh, um, their agricultural resources. But as the villages grew, the population grew, but this led to a couple of, of, um, of important negative effects. Well, the Saracens had now arrived. They'd conquered during the late seventh century, the whole of North Africa, crossing into Spain in 711, Gibraltar, Jebel al tariq reaching, as you know, Poitiers in 738. They moved into Sicily and they gradually conquered Sicily. Then they set their eyes on Italy, never really conquered much, conquering much of Italy, but, but launching raid after raid after raid, capturing Taranto and Bari, but ostensibly creating an enormous base, pool base of slaves, slaves that could be used to create, to build the economy of the Arab world from North Africa to the Levant, probably as far as Baghdad. Now, this was a major blow to, uh, to Byzantium, especially the loss of Sicily, which was a great reservoir of grain and probably ag other agricultural resources. So the late, in the late ninth century, Emperor Basil I decided to reconquer the territory, expand the territory into Italy and reintroduce the monetary economy. Sicily was left to its own, but suddenly Byzantine Southern Italy reached much further north than it had in the past. This seems to have been a positive moment leading to ever rapid growth in the 10th, 11th century that was finally, finally uh, stunted, cut off in the mid to late 11th century when the Normans arrived and that was the end of Byzantine Italy. So we have eight phases, eight fascinating phases of, of story of what happens in this territory. <laughs> so uh, I'm not to do much more reading for you and just give you some examples. So here we are, um, probably just after the just, Justinianic War, second half of the sixth century, uh, sites, major sites, Hedonia, a Roman town, Ignatia, another Roman town, are totally abandoned. Well, in Ignatia, they build a small fort. I don't know if you can see a square fort with angle towers, probably built, built by Morris Tiberius at the end of the uh, 6th century. But that lasted very, very shortly as well, because the town was then totally burnt, and in all the burnt deposits that seemed to represent ultimate destruction was found a small ring, a lovely gold ring, that seems to represent the Holy Sepulchre of Jerusalem and may well have belonged to the bishop, perhaps running away or killed by a Lombard invasion as the Lombards were pushing south. So that led to eight ever greater defensing defenses. Southern Salento, across the Southern Salento was built what I see, what seems to be a massive wall, the Limitone dei Greci. Um, this was excavated by a student of mine in 2005. And we've got marvelous carbon-14 dating, as you can see, from 670 to 880. So we're talking about the uh, mainly the 8th and part of the 9th century when it was built. Um, and it is a defense. I'm sure it is a territorial defense between Byzantines in the south and uh, the Lombards to the north. But that even that wasn't safe enough. So what do we have in towns? Well, the town of Lecce, where I live, was never totally abandoned, but I think most of ancient Lecce was abandoned just because there were no more people, very, very few people. But Lecce continued throughout these difficult centuries because we hear of Lecce as the center of uh, resistance when the Normans try to retake southern Italy. Now, 
the archaeology of Lecce, unfortunately, is not very developed. But I have been looking at the amphitheatre, because in many parts of uh, Europe, we find amphitheatres being used as castra. And in the case of the one of Lecce, if you compare the slide to the top left to the slide at the bottom left, you will see the amphitheatre after and before it was restored. Well, before it was restored, when it was just dug out, it was full of holes, of doors, not left, right and centre, which were not part of the original building, but seemed to want to create many small, uh, I would say, houses within the structure of the amphitheatre. Also, if you look at the big plan, where I have superimposed the two ellipses of the amphitheatre, if you follow the two ellipses to the left, you will see that they end up with a large church called Santa Maria delle Grazie, which is a 16th century church. But I'm ready to bet that beneath that church, there is a 7th or 8th century church, as happens in many, many other cases throughout the medieval world. So this was Lecce in Byzantine times, a castrum, a redoubt, a place to house the people to farm the land, but also to protect against further uh, incursions by the Lombards. But as I said, continue population. These are 8th to 10th century villages. Almost every day we find new Byzantine villages. Uh, here, for example, two site surveys between Lecce and its coastal port at San Cataldo. One survey found in, uh, done in 1992 revealed no Byzantine property at all. A survey conducted in 2006-2007 has yielded 13 Byzantine sites that were not recognized. Now, the big thing here is that between 1992 and 2006-2007, we started working on Byzantine pottery, and we can now recognize it. In 1992, the archaeologists were unable, un unable to recognize the horrible, great, well, I love it, horrible, grotty, brown and green and black Byzantine cooking wares. They can now be recognized and dated. And strangely enough, we see more sites in uh, Byzantine times than we do in, uh, in Roman times. Another area. The Alimini Lakes. Well, the Alimini Lakes are just north of uh, Otranto, the main town, and they face Albania. Again, field survey has brought out a host of 8th century sites. You'll see the red sites in the map on the left. Now, doing uh, column, pollen diagrams, searching for uh, pollen cores in the lake by two uh, scholars from the University of Rome, has shown that in this period, from late antiquity onwards, there was investment in olives until by the eighth century, you have an enormous production of olives and olive oil, which cannot have been for local consumption just because of its scale. So we have linked this to Otranto, where we found uh, uh, an amphrokiln that produced these globular vessels that you see in the lower left. The vessels themselves look as though they're wine amphora, but I get the feeling now that they're actually polyfunctional. Oil from alimony and perhaps wine from the immediate hinterland of Otranto. But what they do indicate is um, strong urban, uh, sorry, strong rural settlement, because you need the people to work the sites in the countryside to produce such a large surplus, surplus, and they indicate overseas exchange. In a period when we are in, in, in what we call the real Byzantine Dark Ages. So we prepared for a, um, a, a conference in Toronto on network analysis to see how Otranto fitted in to an 8th century Byzantine, Byzantine network. And it fits in very, very well with a few other sites like, well, Constantinople, of course, Athens, of course, um, Crete's not bad. Um, Otranto is in the thick of things, as is Syracuse. And remember, Syracuse is the port in the 
um, southeast uh, island in southeast Sicily and was the major port for exportation of the resources of Sicily. So my contention is that the Byzantine occupation of Puglia and Calabria was functional to keeping the re route open from the east, from Constantinople to Syracuse, as Syracuse was one of the principal granaries or, or reservoirs of what was needed by Eastern Byzantium. And that is why we see so many typical Byzantine remains, Eastern Byzantine remains in Western Sicily. So the countryside, what was happening in the countryside in this period? Well, we're after the first period of trauma. Uh, we're now into the eighth century. People are starting to settle down. How did they settle down? Well, I think there was a role in the church here. I think the church played a great role, as possibly also the monasteries. We have a very strange monument in this area called the, uh, the Menea. Here, this is a, a Salento Menea. And these men here are not prehistoric, as many people believe, but almost certainly early medieval. I believe they were built in the 8th century to hold uh, services, church services in the countryside for scattered populations. And I do not think it is a coincidence that around many of these men here, Byzantine settlements later, uh, later crystallized. What you have probably have is the church uh, beginning to, uh, to evangelize the countryside. Now, if you look at the world, the Vicinanza Giordignano Menhir 4 is actually on the site of a village called Vicinanza. Um, in the town of Giordignano, or the site of the town of Giordignano, which is another Byzantine village, on the road to Quattromagina, which was another Byzantine village. If you look at the one at the top left, you have the Menhir of Supersado, now, well, later quaintly used as a bridge to cross a, a, a small uh, uh, river or channel. Now, the Supersado Menhir was found next to a village site that I will show you very, very shortly. Monasteries, briefly want to touch monasteries because the monasteries in this period, the monast medieval monasteries that we know of, are all dated to Norman times, that is from the 11th century. We even have what appear to be foundation documents, such as the Typicon from the great Italo greek monastery of St. Nicholas of Casale, said to have been founded by Prince Bermond, a Norman, in 1098-99, that is right at the end of the 11th century. It was the biggest monastery in the territory of southern Salento, southern Puglia. When we did, unfortunately we haven't been able to excavate it, but when we did field survey, we found that if you look at the map bottom left, the area of the red and the orange are the area of pottery scatter of a dense Byzantine pottery. And the church is in the center of the dense Byzantine pottery scatter. So I believe that many monasteries that are said to be Norman date to much earlier times, and so that monasteries also played a large part in the in settling the Byzantine landscape. Um, let's go ahead. Ah. So Supersano, I showed you the men here. The men here was here at another Byzantine village. So they cannot be prehistoric. I don't believe the prehistoric because the association is almost always between men here and 8th century Byzantine village. So the men here at this point, which do not look like prehistoric men here to me, they don't look like Karnak, they don't look like Stonehenge, they look like the high crosses of northern, uh, the high crosses of Ireland or, or northern Britain, or the, uh, what do you call them, the catch cars in Armenia. All high crosses, literally. Um, so here we have a village of Supersano. It's a unique site because it's the only 8th century village that I know of that has been fairly um, uh, extensively excavated. And you see, it's nothing like a Roman site. Um, here we have uh, a large um, uh, boundary wall, a well, small drainage ditches, and a number of large pits. These large pits are, as far as I can see, the basis of sunken featured buildings. 
sunken featured buildings have always been interpreted almost always as barbarian architecture, Lombard, Franks, Anglo-Saxons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But now we have sunken featured buildings in absolute certain Byzantine territory. The three, the, uh, the small one single picture in the top right is from Bova in Calabria, excavated by a friend of mine, right into the Calabria, again, in Byzantine territory, where the other ones are, uh, the are excavated in Supersano. So we can't really look at peasant agriculture, peasant structures, as anything like what we had in Roman times, at least not in this area. Things have totally changed and tend to look more like proto-historical pro Iron Age buildings than anything else, although, of course, material culture is early medieval. Here is the well. You can see the boundary wall. We excavated the well. We got those marvelous um, amphorae and jugs from the well. Um, but the most astounding, astounding thing of the well is that uh, right in the bottom, as you can see, it was uh, waterlogged. And right in the bottom part, you can find, we, we found a large quantity of uh, organic remains. An enormous quantity. Unfortunately, not many instruments. Um, we have a dibber. A dibber was used by peasants to poke holes in the soil so they could then drop in the seeds, sowing, sowing the fields. A bow, somebody who went hunting or used it for protection, that was made of pear wood, which is pliable wood. Then we have a cup, blade turned cup and oak. And then we have uh, numerous faunal and uh, botanical remains uh, that lead us to understand both the natural and cultivated habitat. Well, three of these are totally natural, but two are not. We have a lentil, um, so they were eating lentils, and we have the stones of grapes, of a, which have been tested by DNA and are of a Greek variety called thousi. Um, so we're getting importation of grapes. We also have cherries, we have plums, and, and, and other, other things as well. Very, very few imports, because the imports didn't arrive um, at the peasant, not on the peasant sites, as far as we can see. Uh, they were just for production and creation of surplus. They would then go to ports such as Otranto and then be shipped abroad. But a few imports arrived even at the village sites. And here we have two. One is a glass cup, probably from the north of Italy, a small prestigious item, perhaps the most important person in the village. And the other is a very functional item. It's part of a uh, stone uh, quern or hand mill, a rotary quern, which is interesting because it also comes from central Byzantium. It comes from the island of Milos. It is what we call Rima stone, a type of lava, rhyolite lava, uh, that is typical of Milos. And unfortunately, the distribution map is very, very skimpy, but I'm sure that we will find hundreds and thousands of uh, quern stones from Milos in the future when archaeologists begin to recognize the type of limestone, uh, so the type of lava stone that these were built off, out of. But they were fund fundamental for creating flour, so it must have traveled quite a bit. Now, we're seeing an economy on the move. And as I said before, the economy in the move attracted the, slave, the um, Saracens. So here we have from Michael McCormick, uh, a lovely map showing movements of um, slave exports from all over Italy. And you also have slave uh, all over Europe. And you also have slave exports, of course, from, uh, from the Salento to Tunis to, uh, to, to Libya, to Egypt. And we start to get a little bit of uh, archaeological evidence. We have a lot of traditions, oral traditions, but of course that's not uh, objective enough to be certain. 
but there are so many oral traditions that there must be a grain of truth for the truth. But here is a small town called Canale, a student of mine found in a burnt deposit of an eighth century uh, Byzantine village, an Umayyad fowls from Jerusalem dating to the mid eighth century. The only eighth century coin that we have from it, our Salento is not Byzantine, but comes from Jerusalem. So I think we have evidence of a Saxon raid. Sa sorry, that's a, not Saxon, Saracen raid. Um, Another piece of evidence, a monument in southern Salento called Cento Pietre, next to Campo Re. Campo Re means the field of the king, which is another way of saying extensive cemetery. And this was the legendary burial place or mausoleum of Geminianus that tradition has it was killed in a battle with the Saracens. And I'm quite happy to believe that this is a Saracen or at least this is a Byzantine building built to commemorate Geminianus in 814. It certainly doesn't look classical. It certainly doesn't look like late medieval. Unfortunately, it's going to be done a long time ago. And we have little uh, good evidence. Let's see. Some reason, ah, there we go. And again, something else that may be linked to the Saracens and here we have a most marvelous gold ring, um, which I was able to save from a local fisherman who found it underwater, just a few meters away from the shipwreck that you see to the, to the left. That shipwreck was uh, excavated by a colleague of mine and dates to the eighth century. The ring also dates to the eighth century and they were found uh, near this site of Porto Cesario. Now, the interesting thing about this ring is that it belongs to an eparch of Constantinople. It belongs to the governor of Constantinople, and it was found in Italy, in southern Italy, which is very, very strange. Until we read the text and find that the, the, there was a governor called Basilios, who was in, uh, it was Epoch from 864 to 866, and then disappears. In 867, in the midst of the Phocian scandal, the Phocian schism, when the church in Rome and the patriarchate in, in, in Greece and Constantinople were battling away for who would be the new, new patriarch, um, and certain Ignatius or a certain Photius, well, at a certain point, um, the emperor at the time, uh, Emperor Basil, decided that he wanted to be to nominate Photius against Ignatius, who was the papal um, candidate. So he sent a mission to Rome, and the mission was headed by a certain Basilios. I believe that he was the same Basil who the year before was Epaph of Constantinople, who then went on a mission to Rome to, to explain to the Pope why they wanted Photius. They then left, the mission left to return to Constantinople, and we hear no more about Photius until, of course, we find his ring in the middle of the water in a small Italian port in Puglia. So he may well have been killed, uh, perhaps in... Uh, in a fight, uh, in a wreck, uh, leading to a wreck in, in southern Puglia, but that is just a bit of a story. It's a hypothesis, but quite fun. So Basil I decided he, that he would reconquer Italy. They had lost Sicily. You can see um, the map above. The areas that were lost in the mid 8th century are in pink. The area, sorry, are in, um, in, in green around 750s. The areas lost in the 8th century are in pink, and the areas that remain Byzantine are in mauve. Now you see that Sicily is lost to the Arabs before Emperor Basil I gets to the throne. So what does he do? He sends his troops into Bulgaria that needed to be recaptured, 
recaptured a good part of the Balkans and then moved into Italy and recaptured much of southern Italy. Not recapturing uh, Sicily, but in a sense, he made up for what was lost through the Arab conquest, he made up through his Im imperial expansion. As I say, Sicily was an important reservoir. If you lost Sicily, you needed something else or you'd fall. The reconquest brought about much further investment of uh, Constantinople in, in the West. We have Bari reconquered in 876 from the Saracens, the construction of a big praetorium, the construction of churches uh, dedicated to Eastern saints. We get the influx of money. Um, you can see money starts to take off at the end of the ninth century and then gets to a peak under Constantine VIII and Romanus, and then another peak even later on. But let's say that from the end of the ninth century onwards, we now have a monetary economy compared to what was first an eco economy, uh, a natural economy or barter. The movement of, more, of coins probably brought in largely through the arrival of troops and immigrants under, under Basil I, led to a diversification of the economy. And we start to have a lot more items appearing that, uh, uh, as you remember, Super Sama had hardly anything. We now have especially coins being appearing on all the sites, and we have various types of pottery. I give you three examples here. The famous Otranto amphorae in the uh, bottom right, which were made probably in the Salento and probably also at Corinth. They're very hard to distinguish. Then we have the excised ware, which, as you can see, were again was again produced in various places, uh, found certainly in many places, Crete, uh, Central Greece, Albania, that's from Butrint and Southern Italy, and all over the Salento, and, and then the pails or these sort of strange, what they look like, they look like cooking pails, which I think through ethnographic uh, analogies maybe for milk, yogurt, cheese, I don't know, we will, we will see, we're doing uh, isotope analysis on them. So we're, we're in a period of growth, and the growth is illustrated also by new churches, uh, imports such as the Eucharist stamp from Constantinople, Venice, Soleto. We have Church of San Pietro d'Otranto, another Byzantine cross and square church at Castro. In the 11th century, we start to get marvelous, typical Eastern construction in Bari, such as the capital below, and the best of Byzantine epigraphy, uh, as you can see in the column in Brindisi. Uh, on the right, the base, um, on the left, the base of the column, of one of the two columns of the Via Appia, with the beautiful inscribed Byzantine base recording Lupus um, Protus Pata. And then the uh, beautiful inscription uh, recording George Maniakis and a certain Constantine. Maniakis was a, a usurper from Sicily, Byzantine usurper, and then the general who was eventually killed on on way to Constantinople. But the inscription records the Byzantine fleet and the captain, Admiral Constantine, who had lent, landed on these shores to try and stop uh, Maniakis from crossing the Adriatic. So things were now all in uh, in a great moment of growth, a growth that would certainly, surely, have continued to show the splendors of the uh, post-1000 uh, Byzantium that we know of from Athens and Greece and elsewhere, but it was cut short because of the Norman arrival in the second half of the 11th century. So we have a reconstruction here of the Mot of Supersano. And that ends the 500 years of Byzantine domination in Southern Italy. What we will now do over the next few months is finish the uh, research project. We've already started to publish. These are our first two scientific monographs that appeared, uh, which are in a series called Temata. Uh, one on uh, Sicily from Polis and urban, um, urban life in Sicily from Polis to Medina, and the second on the production of, of, uh, of um, glass 
uh, in southern Italy, Arab, Byzantine, and later um, um, a, a conference. There are other volumes to be published, and we're also, also hoping on publishing a guidebook for the general public, so they will have a new story of the importance of Byzantium to 600 years of, uh, of Italy. So in the end, we hope that the, the uh, contribution of Byzantium um, to Southern Italy will be making uh, modern, making sense, making understanding the, uh, the South and creating a greater sense of place, that is a greater sense of pride uh, of coming from a Southern Italy that owes over 500 years of its traditions, DNA, uh, singing, food, towns, customs to the East, to Constantinople and elsewhere. That is, in a nutshell, what we want to do. And uh, I thank you very much for your patience. Fini. I hope I haven't sent you all off. To I apologize, Castandinos had <laughs> kept me muted as well, so I could not respond to any of your <laughs> <laughs> questions. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. This was, uh, thank you, not just for this um, informative overview of your project, but also for this uh, fascinating and wonderful uh, survey of Byzantine archaeology in general. What you presented, and I'm sure many of uh, your and our students uh, realize, um, is, is that uh, this overview of the ups and downs of Byzantium beyond uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, the Aegean and the Eastern Mediterranean, west of the Adriatic, is, is really, um, really parallel global phenomena taking place. Around the same time, things in the West are uh, moving faster than in the East. Uh, so that's also fascinating in itself. I, I was really amazed by uh, these finds of yours, the Meniers that you that you mentioned. I don't know if you're aware of this book by Martin Carver, uh, The Cross Goes North, where you can actually find a few references to such stones in places like Ireland and Britain. I know those, yes. It, it, it's interesting, you know, those stones, standing stones, perhaps um, marking boundaries, ecclesiastical boundaries, or, you know, what you, you, you mentioned is, is also quite fascinating. I, I, I think I have identified a couple of those in the Aegean. Perhaps we can talk further. Yes, at some other stage. Yes. Um, there's, a good, there's a good book uh, or a good study on some examples around Shanakale, the Bosphorus. Right. If you don't have it, I can send you the reference. I can send you the PDF. Yeah. Great, thank you so much. Uh, but I will not say more. Let's turn to our chat and see if there are questions or comments for you. Um, uh, those of you who would like to, instead of typing, um, address your question or comment to Paul Arthur, you may uh, raise your hand and uh, then unmute your microphone. Um, there are comments, of course, and many congratulating messages on your wonderful presentation, um, but no questions yet. Yes. Um, uh, Massi, Massimiliano Secchi has a question. Yes, you may unmute your microphone, Massi. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. First of all, buonasera, I, come sta? Any, um, any. Uh, I was curious about the, uh, the the large cemetery, the legendary cemetery that you mentioned uh, in one of your slides. Uh, how was the disposition of uh, the, 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 the of the tomb inside? Because it reminds me of. Uh, of a similar tomb, ah, and, and uh, the other part of the question is, was it found related to a church or some sacred space or place? Uh, because it reminds me of a very uh, exact or similar 
um, cemetery, or, or actually it was only one uh, monumental tomb for an individual uh, in, found in Sardinia, in oh. central Sardinia. It was excavated as a, you know, uh, uh, preventive archaeology, archaeologia preventiva. So yes. I don't think it has been published, but I know of it because a, a few colleagues um, did the excavation and I visited the site, so it was just, but mm. yeah, I'm wondering, and it was right behind uh, a church, a modern church that was built on remains of uh, Byzantine and was rebuilt over and over uh, since, uh, since the, I think, ninth, ninth century or some sort, or maybe very, earlier. Very interesting. Uh, very interesting. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure if I know about the example you're talking about. Now, the one we have is Cento Pietre, is the large monument I showed you, built of massive reused blocks from the classical, from a classical site nearby. Okay. Um, but it's not a classical building. And the blocks are probably Hellenistic. I'm sure the building dates to 8th, 9th century. Now, the tradition says the battle was in 814 and that Geminianus was killed in that battle. Uh, as I said, it lies next to a field called Campore. Now, within the building, there are a series of tombs. I can't remember how many, I think about a dozen tombs. They appear outside the building. And if you go into nearby Campore, there are hundreds of tombs, hundreds of early medieval looking tombs. The only problem is that they were excavated in the 1970s, and we still don't know yet where the skeletons are, if they've been kept and what has been found in those tombs. They've been temporarily, I hope, lost, but when we find them, then we may be able to prove um, the tradition. We will be able to seek carbon-14 date bo bones to do analysis, uh, isotopic analysis for prominent studies. And so perhaps we will find a large uh, Byzantine Saracen uh, battleground. But unfortunately, at the moment, it, it rests on some sim somewhat tenuous evidence. If I took a photograph from the mausoleum looking eastwards, you would see a large church called St. John the Baptist. So it is built yes. next to the church, or, or rather, I think the church was built next to the mausoleum. First the mausoleum and the battle, and then the church, as it became a very more important sacred site. Okay, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Masi. Um, I found very interesting the fact that um, uh, I mean, what you what you mentioned at the beginning of your talk that I mean, specialists Byzantinists themselves uh, tend to forget that you know Byzantium extended beyond uh, what is today Greece, um, and and. and uh, it, it, is, it is so interesting to see what is happening. I mean, at the time of this deep depression and contraction and shrinkage in the rest of the Byzantine world, in the 8th century, uh, southern Italy and Sicily seemed to, as you mentioned, to have already entered a period of you know, recovery, slow recovery in the 8th century. So there is so much to learn from the archaeology of that part of, of, uh, um, of the Mediterranean. And I, my question relates to the um, location, to the to the uh, large number of settlement sites that you have recorded in the course of your uh, project on the on the heel of the Italian pin of the boot, uh, Lecce. Um, how do you explain this? I mean, is it just archaeological visibility, more uh, systematic archaeological work that has been carried out in that part of? Uh, the peninsula in relation to other neighboring regions? What, how do you explain this? Well, if... I, 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 have di I have different explanations. I think it's, 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 it's a, there is a, a bundle of, of explanations. When I first came here um, and, and said, I, I, I looked at the texts, not very many, um, got the uh, Byzantine, the, the, the the context of Byzantine history, um, and then wanted to see things on the ground. 
Now, what they could see on the ground was hardly anything. A couple of standing churches, lots of cave churches with, with paintings, but most of the Byzantine paintings were actually later. They were in style, but they were post-Norman. Um, and then the only finds were usually coins because coins are easy to recognize. So I realized that if we wanted to discover Byzantium, we had to understand what the sites were like and what the cultural material was like. So we spent the first part of uh, the, my, I've been working, not the project, I've been working in this area for over 20, 30 years. I spent the first time of my time, uh, the first part of my time trying to get as many uh, stratified contexts as possible from places like Otranto and near Otranto to get to know the material culture, to see what the ceramics were like. Now, 90, 99% of the ceramics are very, very coarse wares, mm -hmm. uh, often fired badly, not what people who love, um, uh, what do you call them, the black and red figure vases would call nice. Mm -hmm. But I love them um, because I think they, they tell the story. Uh, when you get people experienced in field survey, but mainly classical times, picking these pieces up, they put them into a bag with Roman cooking ware. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so I find my 7th, 8th, 9th and 10th century in a bag with 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th and 6th century cooking ware. Yes. Uh, and, and it's only through getting to know in detail what the difference is i can say look most of your cooking ware is not roman it's later and i'm finding site after site after site that are date from the later seventh century onwards which nobody knew about beforehand they are there now the other consideration so what one is is certainly yes the the type of archaeology you do I mean, you, you, you usually find well, you usually find what you recognize. I mean, if a prehistorian goes field work in doing field work with classicists, I can bet you he'll be the one that finds the flints. <laughs> um, if you don't recognize something, you will never find it. But the other thing is that there's a, a, an overriding, almost nationalistic uh, sentiment, even in archaeology, Rome was great. We want Rome. Most, most archaeologists are classicists. And so they want to find Rome. The rest doesn't matter very much. So they're not going to force themselves. They'll just follow the usual story of everything went bump in the night and during the 6th century. After the 6th century, after the end of uh, the African red slip whale, or Terra Sigillata Chiara, that was the end of, of, of the countryside. We now know it's not true. Um, I think these are my main cons uh, considerations. Um, so I think there is a lot to be found, but we just must to start working rather like people used to work in Iron Age archaeology or prehistoric archaeology rather than classical archaeology, because even monuments, even sites, uh, all structures are going to be very, very simple compared to those of classical times, but not less fascinating. Yes. A sense, <laughs> it's, it's pioneering, but I think you know this, uh, uh, Francis. I yes. think it's something you know already because I've seen your, read some of your very good work around Sagalassos and, 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 and in Cyprus. Thank you. Uh, I, I, the, the, your, your story is, I, I, I totally understand, and, and I can only testify that it is exactly the same thing that uh, happens in Greece or in Cyprus when the survey archaeology was booming in the 90s and early in the millennium. Um, people tended to back all courses along with Roman, mostly late Roman, because this is the period they knew. So anyway, uh, there is a question by my, uh, my colleague Maria Parani. Mm. Um. Uh, good evening, uh, Professor Arthur. Thank you very much. I wanted to ask in relation to what you said about attitudes towards uh, the Byzantine period. 
uh, are you planning any, as part of your project, any social outreach uh, activities or getting together with the educators and the people who are writing the books? Uh, because you are bringing up so much fascinating um, uh, new information about, as you said, about their own identity, uh, the people's identity, their roots, the, the richness of their culture. So uh, do you apply, apart from the scientific publications, do you have any other plans or have you been engaging? With this kind of activities, and what are the responses? Have you get uh, have you been getting any any feedback from the people? Um, so well, we, we've just started doing that. But one, the first thing and the easiest thing I do is I go, I accept all invitations to lectures by public groups, uh, the local mm -hmm. other society, or the or the Rotary or Lions. Or, uh, or any any cultural groups or local say would you please go lecture I say yes and and I, I I'll speak about this sort of thing in different terms in more in simpler terms but that's what I do and and they usually always find it fascinating and you get some people who will turn to their per, the person sitting next door to them and said I told you so <laughs> um, uh, and so I think there's a uh, there's now a sense of pride in uh in 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 having this this greek byzantine component to them um because we have had for political reasons as i said before and especially church the church re reasons uh, ideological reasons italy had to be pure it had to be recognized as something born and developed in italy without outside influence the idea that in, that italy that had the Roman Empire that conquered a large part of the ancient known world could then be conquered for half a millennium by an external empire is something that nationalists do not like, yeah. um, both politically and church-wise. So you can see why these things have happened. Mm -hmm. uh, but from the people nowadays, they're... I get a lot of positive feedback when I say, well, you know, these, this food that you're eating, I've eaten the same thing in a taberna in Athens. And it's not because the taberna in Athens is imported from Italy. It's because it grew up there and was imported here a thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then changed slightly in, mm -hmm. in Italy. Changed slightly in in, in Greece, okay. um, but it's it's they have the same base, mm -hmm. um, and people find it fascinating. I think people are more willing to accept that now. Okay. But I want to get down to the nitty gritty, like uh, genetics, to actually mm -hmm. say to people, do you know that you are forty percent Byzantine, twenty percent. Somali, I don't know. <laughs> the rest is Italian. Uh, but we are all, we are all mixed, all of us. So. I guess in our times, this kind of biological information carries more weight than, you know, saying we share the same, you share the same pottery or something. It's kind of like, yeah. Well, thank you very much and all the best, all the best with your, with your excellent work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. Uh, talking about uh, Byzantine legacy in, in southern Italy, one of, in, on one of your slides there was a picture of, I think it was Panacopita, the spinach pie, and you had a second term next to that, uh, which, if I'm not mistaken, is not quite Greek, it's, it's Arvanitic, it's Albanian. So, I, I'm, because, of course, not all of them perhaps originate from uh, the sixth century in Italy, but yes, but through other, uh, um, you know, uh, yeah. I mean, well, uh, yes, I, I, other groups in the 14th, 15th century from places like the Peloponnese and Central Greece, uh, yeah. Arvanitic in origin. Uh, is, is, are they aware of it? I'm asking because where I work in Central Greece, I mean, things have changed so rapidly 25 years ago, 
well, that sounds like a long time, but <laughs> to me it's not. 25 years ago when we were working with John Binkley in Central Greece, most of the villagers in Boeotia did not want to talk about their Arvanitic descent. If you uh, go back now, this, this new generation, they're very proud of it. Um, I mean, do you find um, these groups, do they identify themselves as Greek, as Arvanitic, as what? Those that do stop, talk about this. They, they, they do now. There's less, I mean, because the, the elderly um, come out of the Second World War. I mean, the, the, the fathers or the grandfathers come out of the Second World War and fascism when nationalism was very, very, very strong. You couldn't teach anything that was not Italian in schools. Um, Mussolini even wanted to to uh, ban all dialects, which was difficult for people in Sardinia, for example, where where it's almost like a separate language. But he said, you know, in school you've got to do this, and and this is our history, and this is, and so uh, there's been a, a sort of brainwashing. But now that people are beginning to see that there are other parts of the story, they they get very very proud. They are very proud. Now we. People used to speak Greek until the first half of the 19th, of the 20th century, and then it disappeared. Just a few very, very old people. Now there are schools that teach young, the young Greek, because they want to know Greek, they want to understand their origins and why their grandfathers and great grandfathers spoke like that and didn't speak in Italian. And, and that's tied to all uh, uh, a host of other other things. Um, so I think things are changing that way, um, which is, is, is very heartening. I, I think it's, it's important we know what happened. I mean, whether, whether, whether you like it or not, whether politicians or the church like it or not, it's very, very important because then we can really talk about history and understand why the world is as it is. We can't change history. We shouldn't change history. But we can better the future, and the more we know, the easier, easier it will be. Sure. I would, I would, I thank you for what you were saying first about the the food. Um, unfortunately, there's a diff big difference, of course, between the online lecture, the and and being present, because being present, you can then go and speak to people afterwards, and and so the learning curve may be a bit stronger for he who is listening than who is speaking. But I feel that I've got a lot to learn from people I'm speaking to. They, they will say, ah, yes, but, or I know of, or that should be. So what I, I, I'm saying is, you have my email. Um, I would ask you to give it to everybody and invite them to tell me if they see anything that is wrong or or can be modified or has interesting, uh, what to say, um, um, effects for them. Um, so I can, we, we must be closer in this sort of thing if you want to understand what's happening. Now I'm convinced, I don't want to give another lecture, but I'm convinced that Southern Italy was fundamental to Byzantium because of the resource base. It was needed. And that's what many scholars don't understand. So when Sicily was lost, it was a big blow that had to be repaired by Basil I's reconquest. It's rather like today with Russia blockading the Ukrainian grain fields and the effect it's having all around the world. Not, not just grain fields as well. Now, of course, the, the fuel. Um, it must have been a massive effect on Byzantium, losing North Africa, then losing Sicily, and, 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 um, but it managed to survive, which is incredible. It's a great story. Indeed, yes. Um, I, I would like to ask again if there is um, um, anyone who would like to make a comment or question. In the meantime, I would like also to make an announcement that uh, next Monday on the 27th of February, there will be no lecture uh, in our series because it's Clean Monday. It's the first day of, the, of Lent in, in uh, the Greek Orthodox calendar. So uh, 
we will meet again online for our next lecture, which will be given by uh, Dr. Christina Haywood from uh, University College Dublin. Uh, we move to the Ionian Sea uh, Hall next week, uh, and her lecture is titled Late Bronze Age Archaeology of, of the Island of Kefalonia in the 21st Century, from Culture History to Hermeneutics. So that's uh, in two weeks' time, uh, on March the 6th. In the, uh, there is also, amongst the projects you mentioned and the book by um, Cosentino, there is also a, a New Year's project uh, directed and uh, headed by uh, Helen Fox of Forbes from the University of Durham. Uh, well, it's not exactly about Italy, but it's about the Mediterranean climatic change and how that affected uh, society, uh, settlements and, and the natural environment, of course, in uh, the first millennium. So I'm sure that will perhaps give us more uh, more new data and conclusions regarding this period of uh, changes from another perspective. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, Paul, yes, is there something else you would like to add uh, to tell us before we say goodbye? Well, that I miss you all. <laughs> and, uh, I hope as soon as possible to, to, to meet everybody. Yes. And I would like to thank them for their, their patience in my ramblings. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Paul. No rumblings. Thank you. It was fascinating. Carry on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Paul, for accepting. That's uh, my colleague. I don't know if you remember Froso mm -hmm. uh, You sat in the same committee uh, 10 years, perhaps, ago. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much and hope to, uh, first of all, we can't hear you, your microphone. I'm just saying that it was very interesting, uh, fascinating lecture. Thank you very much. It was nice to see you. Thank you very much to you, you too. Glad to see Good you. Good luck. Thank you. Wonderful. So uh, thank you everyone for uh, attending our lecture tonight. But we hope to see you in two weeks time again on Another lecture in the concert. And please, please give everybody my email. Yes, please do write to us. Do write to me and I can pass you on uh, Professor Arthur's email if you would like to have a discussion with him in private or give information on everything he can talk to us. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Um, good night. Thank you all. Thank you.